Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at the plenary of SCA's 50th anniversary annual general meeting. First, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking from the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Alone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramaytush Alone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As a guest, I recognize that I benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As a guest, I pay my respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community, and by affirm affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. I encourage all of you, if you have not already, to learn about the land you occupy and the link shared by Leilani, and to take a moment to express your gratitude as well. I would also like to acknowledge our grief. Our lives, our work, our families, and our, our communities have been disrupted in deeply profound ways, ways that we still cannot fathom. I also wish to acknowledge the grief of our colleagues and communities that have been and continue to be terrorized by state-sanctioned murder and racist acts of random violence. But today, I also wish to express gratitude for this opportunity to be here together now. This has been a year of growth and transitions for SCA. And as I finish my term as president during this year of pandemic, but also the 50th anniversary of SCA, I'm proud of all that we've achieved and feel that there is much to celebrate despite our losses and our grief. I owe a deep debt to all of those who stepped forward to ensure that we could gather in place virtually this year. Our program committee, which has created a stellar program was chaired by our incoming president, Leilani Marshall, and the members of the committee, which include Mallory Fernier, Sue Hodson, who is a representative from the Golden Anniversary Committee, Estella Inda, Kevin Kern, Rebecca Lung, Laurel McPhee, Kate Mills, Grace Song, Mariella Soprano, Kate Steffens, Emily Viger, who is an SCA Local Arrangements Committee liaison, and Sean Vicentainer. I'd also like to express my deepest gratitude to our Local Arrangements Committee members, Ellen Jaroche, Alex Post, and Emily Viger for their tenacity and willingness to take on the hard work of taking this meeting virtual. And finally, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this morning's plenary, the Western States Virtual Book and Paper Fair. Now it is with great, great pleasure that I introduce you all to this morning's speaker, Mark A. Matienzo. Mark had agreed to be the speaker at last year's canceled Western Archivist meeting, and I'm grateful that they were willing to return this year. Their work is more relevant and, and important than ever. Mark's talk today will reflect on the past year, which has been a profound challenge to everyone including archivists and the communities they serve. To quote them, we have struggled to respond and evolve across frequently turbulent connections between maintenance, innovation, and care, as well as increased demands from researchers and our own institutions to provide service. As always, we also experience this amidst our own fears of relevance and being understood. In this talk, they will explore these interconnections, our tendency to be defensive, the potential threats facing archives from certain innovations, and our own continued collaborations as networks of care. Mark is an archivist, technologist, and ambient musician. Their work for Stanford University Libraries includes serving as the project lead for Lighting the Way, an IMLS national forum grant focused on improving archival discovery and delivery and managing a portfolio of digital library discovery and access services and systems. Mark received a MSI from the University of Michigan School of Information and a BA in philosophy from the College of Worcester and was the 2012 recipient of the Mark A. Green Emerging Leader Award from the Society of American Archivists. Mark resides on the unceded ancestral lands of the Duwamish people, past and present, who are still actively working for federal recognition. 
please join me in welcoming Mark Matienzo. Thank you, Tanya. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to speak with you at SCA today. As Tanya said, uh, this talk focuses on, I think, three main things, um, imaginaries, commons, and care. I will also speak to a process of self-understanding about my work at the intersection of archives, uh, social systems, and technical systems, and how I think we should approach the work that we undertake in terms of systems design as an expression of care, as a core part of understanding a liberatory archival commons. It draws heavily on speculative fiction like Ursula Le Guin, Marge Piercy, and Octavia Butler, understandings of affect within archival relationships, how imaginaries structure reality and vice versa, and autonomous feminism. This slide shows some of my older ideas from when I was originally supposed to keynote last year at WAM. Some ideas, not all, uh, uh, survived last year. Some morphed significantly uh, and some are the product of an idle brain on the days and nights of the pandemic when I've been more well rested and able to synthesize complicated ideas. It is also informed by a network of caring colleagues who have challenged me to be bold in my demands and vision and to simplify my language around complex ideas demanding tangible examples over pure theory. I wish to thank Dorothy Berry, Eric Tanzi, Hillel Arnold, Erin O'Meara, and Shayla Weber for their critical feedback and patience as they waited through multiple drafts in a short time frame. As some of you know, Shayla is also my partner and I want to recognize her twice for the care and support she provided in terms of cooking, cleaning, and maintaining our home while I worked on this talk. Finally, the perspective I talk of in my talk is also informed by who I am and my, by my experience. I'm a settler now living on Duwamish unceded lands, previously living on Ramaytush Shaloni lands, a fat, disabled, neurodivergent, Latina, queer, non-binary child of an immigrant, lucky, as it were, to now live a com comfortable upper middle class experience. My work as an IT manager within a digital library program means I'm responsible for overseeing development and maintenance of our systems that support people being able to find, access, and use our collections and services. And as a digital strategist, I look at the big picture of where we've been and where we're going. Much of my work focuses on identifying opportunities and making a case and investing in them. In both cases, I'm not only focused on the work of my institution, but that of open source software and open standards communities. Holistically, uh, it also means that I need the ability to care for what we create and maintain, the people who do that work, and the broader communities that contribute and use the software develop, we develop. While I'm not actively working with records on a day-to-day -day basis, in my day job as an IT manager. Uh, I nonetheless still identify professionally as an archivist. I refer to myself as an archivist and technologist because I sit at that intersection comfortably, using the past to inform what I help shape for now and the future. Part one, utopia, innovation, and imaginaries of forgetting. I moved to California just over four years ago as a settler working for a certain large private research university in Santa Clara County on a term position. It was a calculated risk, one that I was privileged enough to take at the time. In the interest of full disclosure, I no longer live in California, although living there for nearly four years allowed me to build a deep attachment and affection to the state, the land and the people, especially other archivists. I was drawn to the mythos of the Golden State from the first time I visited many years ago and I often still yearn for its coast, trees, poppies, mountains, and desert. I'm not from California. I was a settler there and now I've left. My employer is still there and to be sure my body, mind, and spirit will return for work and to be fulfilled. And I'm grateful for the time that I lived there. In many ways, as try as it may sound, California is a place where I not only learned how to be myself, but to be myself better and to recognize that I'm always already becoming myself. However, uh, I kind of bristle when I hear myself say those words out loud because I know they're incredibly cliche. I know that I'm a fool for buying into the mythos of the California dream and a fool from, for being willing to walk away from it. 
like a lot of you, um, I've been watching a lot of prestige TV during the pandemic, and the California dream is all over it. Just like how the California dream itself was instrumental in the construction of California, especially from the mid 19th century onwards. A legacy of failed communes and speculative schemes has never slowed California's booster class from projecting utopian visions onto the territory, resources, and people of California, according to Alexander Robert Tarr. Utopian imaginaries, as well as dystopian ones, loom large in the collective psyche of and about California, itself a land of plenty and disaster, often simultaneously. Fire, housing insecurity, drought, drugs, floods, poverty, riots, mudslides, new religious movements, foods insecurity, water rights, and earthquakes are all part of the backdrop, and all of those add to the mythos too. While it may seem obvious as we talk about utopias, the reality that is that utopian imaginaries can also make it easy for us, for, for us to forget the past, the real past, which has material implications on the present. More often than not, this notion of invention, reinvention, and innovation and discovery is itself also the indelible mark of violence and colonialism that we can also see across California. Both the very real California we're now in and California as a utopian imaginary. The, the allure of utopian imaginaries and their core fault is that they are most often perceived as set far away from us in place and time and lack clear outlines of the political transitions needed to get there. Ursula Le Guin reminds us by invoking Milan Kundera's notion, uh, notion of the methods of organized forgetting that this was the legacy of the Spanish renamed the Ohlone and Mitsui indigenous peoples of the Bay Area and Napa, Napa Valley. That these names were forgotten before the people were even wiped out. In her words, we still leave home shouting Avanti and Westward Ho, driven by our godlike reason, which chafes at the limited, intractable, unreasonable present and yearns to free itself from the fetters of the past. The desire to free oneself from the fetters of the past runs thick within the collective unconscious of those of us who've passed through, those who stay in, and those who choose to walk away from California. I too tried to free myself, which has led me to move there in the first place. I wanted to run and reinvent myself and maybe forget some things in order to live a freer life. Part two. California Dream 2.0, Innovation, the Archival Commons, and Archives X.0 as Imaginary. Such stories run loud and clear through what we know of our past and present as it influences the way we think of the technology industry, both through the history and present and the tales we are encouraged to valorize about the part of California in which I lived and for which I still work. That specific Strain of forgetting has a specific refrain in Silicon Valley, as well as across our world, the concept of innovation. That thing we break from, uh, that, that thing we break with the past to stay at the front of the heap and remain relevant. The risk, of course, is that if we don't innovate or take control of the forgetting, we risk being forgotten ourselves. While many archivists are understandably skeptical of an innovation, we are also enamored of it, especially looking at our own work from the past 15 years. In fact, our own national organization, the Society of American Archivists, has an Archival Innovator Award, as well it probably should. There are plenty of opportunities to rethink, alter, and shift what we do. Let's step away from the seemingly timeless utopian imaginary of the Golden State and the California Dream to the Silicon Valley, San Francisco and Sebastopol of the early to mid 2000s. The World Wide Web has entered its awkward teenage stage after the dot-com bubble burst. As part of this transition into its own as a platform where it's not just the content that's important, but the social relations and participatory possibilities that the platform can provide. The web, we are told, is transforming into web 2.0, just as the conference is transforming into the unconference. Blogs, wikis, RSS, tagging, syndication, web services, iteration, and content reuse through Creative Commons licenses and APIs were lighting the way to a bold future. We too had a bold vision of archives and, as platform in the mid to late 2000s that has its own strong undercurrent of innovation. The Archival Commons and Archives 2.0, participatory visions of archives as platform directly inspired by Web 2.0, 
leveraging but not fully identifiable with Web 2.0 imaginaries, technologies, and similar shifts across other fields and sectors. An archival commons itself is a slippery imaginary bound up in the imagination, imaginaries, technology, and technologies of Web 2.0. This imaginary of the archival commons is described by Max Evans as a common and public good rather than the protected property of an institution that gains more value as people use it and contribute to the landscape of information around it through methods like crowdsourcing and transcription, such as that of volunteers categorizing images of creators on Mars through the NASA Click Workers program. For Evans, such participation is its own moral or psychic reward, which he argues is more important than monetary reward. For instance, rather than choosing to watch prestige TV, one can feel morally superior for transcribing birth records for the benefit of the public. Kate Timer's 2011 article in Ar American Archivist constructs Archives 2.0 as an imaginary to provide coherence to a group of transformations within the profession and sector. Many of the transformations described by Timer are constructed as this, not that statements. Open, not closed, transparent, not opaque, user-centered, not record-centered, attracting new users, not relying on users to find them, facilitator, not gatekeeper, innovation and flexibility, not adhering to tradition, and confident about lobbying for resources, not hesitant beggars. While positioned in statements of opposition, Timer repeatedly reminds us that this was not a full break from the past, but rather an evolutionary set of changes that can be seen through the professional literature. These include user studies starting in the 1980s, the slow processes of descriptive standards development and adoption, changes in technology, information management and indexing, and the increase of professionalism. It still gives us the dream of being free from paper minds that hold us back from truly engaging with possibility. This particular construct, which I named as a versioned imaginary, shows up across many sectors, including the archival profession. While we tend not to proactively name things Archives 2.0 anymore, we've seen a subsequent increase in versions. Naively, as a user of technology, I hope that new versions mean new functionality and increased stability, but as a technologist, I know not to hold onto that hope for too long, or even to use the .0 version of anything. But yes, we're on to Archives 3.0, which means everything from new prosthetic architectures for the production and sharing of archival resources or animating the archive, to the increased presence of archives on Wikipedia and the semantic web, to a re-envisioned post-custody 2.0 for government records stored and managed post-custodially on private cloud services for the long term, uh, wherein archives also have, have tangible influence on best practice. Similarly, we are also already at an age of archives 4.0, which can mean everything from the conception of hybrid artist archives as networked interconnected platforms that also ex exist as a space for life, practice, and economic participation to leveraging artificial intelligence to support concepts of trust in records and archives that's based on archival diplomatics. As Le Guin minds us, persevering in one's existence is the particular quality of the organism, is not a progress towards achievement, followed by stasis, which is the machine's mode, but an interactive, rhythmic, and unstable process which constitutes an end itself. Rather than concerning ourselves further with adopting the version imaginary of archives, in other words, archives X.0, we need to acknowledge the complexity and non-Euclidean nature of archives, archival work, and the design of our archival systems. When we step back, we can see many competing versions or versioned imaginaries of archives at play here. While some are positioned as a break from the past and while there's both the risk and promise of forgetting, there's gonna be a large period of time where all of these imaginaries and their real and real, realized instantiations exist. There is no simple actuality of break, rupture or upgrade. One version cannot fully replace the other. Following this understanding, I want to emphasize that we recommit to un understanding archives themselves as integrated socio-technical systems. I call this a recommitment because it's not a new idea. Rather, it's rooted in the work of Margaret Hedstrom's fra framework on research for electronic records, which is 30 years old this year. In his research on the appraisal of web archives as socio-technical practice, Ed Summers engages Hedstrom's framework, emphasizing what gets deemed archival and the very meaning of preservation and access 
are forged in the design and use of information processing systems and attendant standardization practices. Hedstrom indicates that archivists should frame research questions that understand the magnitude of changes and evolution in record keeping practice, rather than solely understanding them parts, as parts of an information revolution. Building on both her and Summers, I argue that we should take an inward and conscious turn as practitioners to consider this practice and the, consider this the practice and information systems that we actively co-create as a new kind of archival commons. Part three, effective reciprocity in the edges of archives. Imaginaries provide important inspiration for us to co-create new, new worlds around ourselves. I want you to imagine, as I have, an archival commons that goes beyond engaging masses of unnamed users seeking moral and psychic rewards. In its place, I want us to imagine an archival commons marked by reciprocity in its relationships between everyone involved in constructing and maintaining it. However, to do so, we will also need to look at our own behavior as individual archivists and as an imagined community. We've started to make many slow and intentional changes to how we work and relate to people in, of, and around the archives, but there's still a long way to go. Michelle Caswell's work on archival imaginaries has been essential in providing a theoretical framework for understanding community archives and envisioning liberatory archival practice. Building on the work of Apaterai and Anderson, Caswell describes the construction of archival imaginaries as an important shared vision in the future, global in reach, wherein archivists are not just memory activists, but visionaries who work reconceives imagined worlds through space and time. She also reminds us that archival imaginaries can influence the work of mainstream repositories by constructing constrained futures that maintain the status quo, that invoke the past to limit the future rather than expand its possibilities. Brillmeyer, Gabiola, Zavala, and Caswell also further introduce the notion of recipro uh, reciprocal archival imaginaries as circular and continually entangled relationships between archival users, their imaginaries, and community-based archives. This notion of reciprocity is also underscored through Caswell and C4's research into, on a theoretical model to apply a feminist ethics of care to archives work and incorporates the concept of radical empathy in archives as between embodied subjects interlinked through relationships made complex through inequity and differences in power and a feeling of mutual care, including care for bodies and the bodily. They introduced four responsibilities in, as, as an expression of the ethics of care, relationships between archivist and the record creator, archivist and the subject of records, archivist and user, and archivist in the larger community, or those for whom the use of records has lasting consequences. Panelists from a 2017 session at the Society of American Archivists meeting on radical empathy and archival practice expanded this to add a, a fifth relationship, that between archivists and archivists. Others have taken a broader, a still broader understanding of what that fifth relationship means, such as advocating for an ethics of care model to support the work of interns and student workers, as Alexandra Bezio, Steve Duckworth, Helena Egbert, Emily Haskins, and Gail O'Hara have done. They argue that radical empathy should be instilled into all aspects of these relationships, including in terms of the manager-employee relationship. This fifth relationship, defined solely as archivist to archivist, is both imprecise and insufficient, however, to distinguish between all the nuance and complexity that exists in such a category. On the one hand, one can view it through the lens of Terry Cook as a responsibility to a community of archivists, an imagined community, more fractured than pluralistic, more prescriptive than holistic in conception. This demonstrates the, the profession, the archival profession as a vocational imaginary, which situates our work as a, as a form of professionalized legitimacy that we seek in relation to non-archivists and which itself is situated among other shared imaginaries. On the other hand, Bezio et al. are situating the argument from a different perspective, not that from an imagined community of archivists, but to actually existing archives workers with their own degree of power, influence, and experience as managers and contingent laborers, whose actions can have a material impact on the lives and careers of other actually existing archives workers, interns, and students. As a profession, we are obsessed with our own legitimacy and our own visibility and relevance. Rightfully so. Eritanzi also describes the threat of archives without archivists a dystopian imaginary not too far off from reality, marked by an austerity cycle of 
underfunding and devaluing archives. Setting funding real realities aside, albeit just for the moment, I posit that our broader profession's obsession with legit legitimacy and relevance leads us to police the boundaries of archi archivists and archives as imaginaries and threatens our ability to, to imagine broader futures. There is the reality that the rest of the world misunderstands what we do, but each occurrence is an opportunity to, to explore the pluripotentiality of actually existing archives and actually existing archivists, as well as their corresponding imaginaries. For me, labeling the fifth responsibility solely as archivist to archivist is also insufficient because I have been informed repeatedly throughout my career by archivists and IT professionals alike that I'm not one of them by the virtue of my title, responsibilities, and positionality. It is a painful reminder that the archival imperative has its own edges or boundaries of difference that have been and continue to be policed by people who get to call themselves ar archivists. In her recent remarks on archival imaginaries, Dorothy Berry notes that while archives and special collections are eager to diversify the collections and descriptive practice, they usually do not describe the hows and whys of their holdings and, uh, and discuss the values represented therein. Archives do not have silences. They say exactly what they mean. It is also my experience as well as those of other archivists at the margins, queer archivists, BIPOC archivists, and archivists with disabilities, that archivists that represent and constitute the dominant order say exactly what they mean too. When archivists are called on these behaviors, Mario Ramirez has written that the tendency of the members of a largely white profession is to fight back in fear of that which disrupts established perceptions and actions. A similar concept has been designated by Antonina Lewis as archival fragility as a defensive posture, posture in which threats to both the records and archiv archivist professional identity equate survival with archival preservation. When someone refuses to acknowledge that I belong in the space or set of professions, it is a constant low grade reminder that I'm a threat to their view of what archives are. And I am reminded constantly that I owe a debt to my employers and the funders who made my work possible. Who told you that I don't get to be an archivist? I have the degree, actually existing student loan debt and the scars of contingent labor, the suggestion to hustle and being charged with organizational change without proper mentorship to lead it. I am less interested in archival preservation than I am in self and collective preservation and a continuous jubilee that will free everyone from all debts, monetary, professional, or theoretical. Part four, archives at point zero or wages for mouse work towards archival commoning. Antonina Lewis also reminds us that in the broadest sense, archives, no less than folklore, are and of, are of and for everyone. Ultimately, it's not that archives need to be disruptive because they're already in a state of disruption. The disruptions we need are to archival industry, the systems and technology, the labor paradigms, the ethical frameworks and the business models. Effective change must also address at a structural scale how the conceptual archives functions as information technology, how it guides and scaffolds society's reproduction of modes of thought and action. In its most complex, that is to say its simplest, the arch archive is atomization. In its simplest, that is to say its most complex form, the archive is a bringing together. Borrowing from Le Guin and Lipschitz, such a vision of an archival commons is not possible without nonlinear and seriously challenging political struggle. To envision an archival commons, we must find a way to undo our own archival fragility, as well as that which we project on an unnamed public that we also expect to contribute to our projects and information landscapes in a meaningful and valuable way. Asking us to be resilient is not sufficient either. Neither our own moral and psychic superiority nor that of citizen archivists will feed ourselves or our children, care for our aging parents, do our or do our laundry, which themselves are highly gendered in uncompensated forms of labor. You cannot fundamentally ask someone to give back to archives, no matter how much prestige TV they might watch to unwind without attending to the material needs of care in our world. What exactly are we asking people to give back to anyway, if we police a vocational imaginary and they receive no material benefit? 
To imagine a liberatory archival commons means many shifts to our life, work, and social relations to reproductive labor and to the social reproduction of our existing imaginaries. In short, it is archival production no longer built on the exploitation of labor. Rather than focusing on, on an archival commons alone, we should look more broadly to the historical and contemporary notions of commons themselves. Commons have been constituted throughout history as places open to and often governed and maintained by all users, whether it be communal pastures, public parks, or the internet and its information resources. One of the primary threats to any commons is the threat of enclosure, which is historically understood as the consolidation of smaller communal land holdings into private ownership, making them unavailable for communal use. This means that commoners, the users of the commons, lose their rights to it. Over time, enclosure became understood as a broader form of commodification and segmentation, wherein the principle of universal public access gives way to a system in which everything has a price tag or access is highly restricted. The old enclosures give rise to new ones, which subordinate every form of life and knowledge to the market and make mobile and migrant labor the dominant form. As archivists, we are impacted by these in familiar ways like student loan debt and term employment that still expects us to love our jobs and valorize the vocational imaginary. While many of us are comfortable objecting to these practices given that we want a more caring vocational imaginary, there are other forms of archival enclosure that are just as insidious and commonplace to mainstream archival repositories. The ability of elite institutions and rare book dealers to control literary archives as a market is a form of enclosure made more problematic by access positive policies in mainstream repositories that reinforce whiteness. Digitization partnerships with private sector companies like Ancestry and Google that embargo public domain cultural heritage materials are a form of enclosure and are incredibly common as are partnerships with state prison systems that use the labor of incar incarcerated people. Sorcery, an alternative to a trip to the archives or in-house in in re in reproduction services that reduces costs by precluding the need to pay for travel and lodging has been heralded as a bold new platform to su support remote access to archives. This has obviously become more difficult during a global health crisis, so it seems pretty compelling. However, sorcery has a quadruple threat of enclosure. It turns digitization into piecework. It leverages an opaque pricing algorithm based on demand and worker surveillance like those used by Uber. It allows credentialed academics to monetize their credentials for access and disclose special collections while suggesting that it's democratizing access. And last but not least, it presents an uncertain future for the digitized versions of the records themselves, even as informal use copies. To constitute a broader archival imaginary, sorry, to constitute a broader archival commons, we need to remember that archivists are not only the not the only ones who do or support archival work, even in mainstream repositories. Perhaps support, substituting archival worker is insufficient as a category when we say archivist to archivist. As a person who helps build and maintain archive systems for access, discovery, and use, the work I do is not in a bubble and relies on the network of people. Other real archivists, uh, those people who work with records or archives users on a daily basis, as well as, uh, as, well as those of us who only do what I call archival mouse work. Software developers, user experience designers, service managers, systems administrators, managers, and more. Whether we like it or not, to build systems is highly relational, requires, requires collaboration, trust, and care, not just for the systems themselves, but also for each other as subjects, colleagues, and caregivers. Just the same, we need to actually find a way to compensate and support everyone else's mouse work too such as that of the so-called citizen archivist and the NASA click workers. Much of the citizen archivist mouse work, as well as, as, well as that of works, workers on sorcery, demands real compensation, as the products of crowdsourced annotation, transcription, and digitization themselves can be subject for enclosure as use as training data for artificial intelligence and machine learning. What I hope for is a degree of co-construction of reciprocal archival imaginaries beyond community archives as imagined by Brillmeyer, Gabriela, Zavala, and Caswell to all archival organizations, even the more mainstream ones. To do so, we need to learn to shift away from these theoretical, from, we need to, we need to learn from these theoretical constructs that reciprocity itself is shifting 
and that at any point we may shift our re relationality in an effective relationship and momentarily or permanently stop being the archivist. We need to stop seeing ourselves as the sole maintainer of the archives and the archival commons and see how our professional and personal knowledge might be applied from everything to help, everything from helping someone with their financial records to estate planning and grief counseling, but not in an effort to acquire, accumulate, or guard something not yet ours or to boast, boost our, our, our own institution standing. Leaning towards this reciprocity is uncomfortable and for some it may require a leap of faith to our own peril that may not feel worth the risk to those of us already at the margins. In an effort to embolden what he referred to as an active archivist, later refined by others as an activist archivist, Gerald Hamm invokes Vonnegut's player piano. Out on the edge, you see all kinds of things that you can't see from the center. Big, undreamed of things. The people on the edge see them first. While this turn of phrase is poetic, the way that Ham uses it reeks of the notion of innovation as rupture. To see this as being the edges of our profession or our professional imaginaries and to get the adrenaline rush associated with living on the edge, like some folks do in California, itself is an expression of privilege, as well as an expression of discovery as erasure, not unlike that which Le Guin relates to the colonialist impulse. It also presumes that without trying, we can pass or bulldoze our way through the boundaries or enclosures without risking our own safety. Our goal is to shift that perspective and to acknowledge a different, radically empathetic impulse, acknowledging the past, present, and future. Rather than a rupture, what I'm asking us to understand is this is an intersection of effective responsibility that is both in and out of time, a tangent point between ideas of and from the past, present, and future that co-evolve alongside one another. It demands not just coexistence, but a commitment to responsible operations, radical cooperation and co-creation, not unlike that imagined by Thomas Padilla as collective investments to support AI and machine learning in libraries. The title of this keynote is intentionally does double duty by invoking our version imaginary of Archives 2.0, as well as the work of autonomous feminist Sylvia Federici and her anthology Revolution at Point Zero, Housework, Reproduction, and Feminist Struggle. Commenting on anthology, Massimo De Angelis writes, the zero point of revolution is where new social relations burst forth from which countless waves ripple outward into other domains. Federici's analysis of reproductive labor and social reproduction is key to understanding that zero point. Her work demands a reorientation away from reproductive labor as a uniquely gendered form of labor, thus degenderizing it. Federici's work over time also resists the tendency to reform and genderize neoliberal structures like debt and inches to, towards adopting these emergent patterns of care in a process of commoning or management of the commons. For Federici, these are a feminist a, for, a form of feminist reconstruction of the commons. Indeed, if commoning has any meaning, it must be the production of ourselves as a common subject. This is how we, we must understand the slogan, no commons without community. Community is a quality of relations, a principle of cooperation and responsibility to each other, the earth, the forests, the seas the animals. The zero point of archives as an imaginary doesn't start at zero and erase the past. It acknowledges embodied history, affect, and material realities, and works towards the abolition of debt and enclosure, not just for archives, but for everyone. It recognizes the relationships between people and community are and should be entangled, which means fighting against the Californian mythos of rugged individualism and personal re reinvention. It recognizes that these relationships, like those identified by Caswell and C4 and the SAA 2017 panelists, also shift over time, just as we find ourselves part of a broader continuum of being caregivers and care receivers. There are times that we need more care than others, and there are times that we can provide more care, just like there are times that we are more like an archivist, more like a user, or more like the subject of the records. It feels a little odd to close this talk poetically with a quote from the earliest article on Web 2.0 by Darcy DiNucci, but it seems appropriate. Ironically, the defining 
trait of Web 2.0 will be that it won't have any visible characteristics at all. The web will be only identified by its underlying DNA structure. On the front end, the web will fragment into countless permutations with different looks, behaviors, and uses. The process will be long and unpredictable though. An organic system of mitosis, mutation, and natural selection that we can only regard with wonder. My imagination leads me to see an already existing archival commons, one that is continually constituted and reconstituted for the role of archivists not to fade, but to blur in and out of focus because of our own effective entanglements, perhaps sticking as close to point zero as possible. It could be that the archival, it's less the archival commons that we seek, but the process of archival commoning without versions attendant to shift from language, reality, material conditions, and reproductive labor. Archival commoning allows us to resist the new and old conclusions that not only threaten us, but also threaten community archives and their associated communities, as well as mainstream repository. As a process, it requires us to continually resist public-private partnerships, all forms of debt and unpaid labor, and work towards the abolition of structures that allow us to perpetuate the old order. It means continually supporting mutual aid for all our communities, including the imagined ones from supporting the Archival Workers Emergency Fund to providing childcare and full meals at all meetings of our professional organizations. It also means showing up with our professional knowledge in more humble ways, like being willing to take minutes in organizing and decision making meetings in activist movements and viewing it as a form of care work that's not about upholding our vocational imaginaries or, collection, or working towards collection development. This process of archival commoning is ceaseless, exhausting, rewarding and inspiring. It allows us not to, to reconstitute not just archives, but society itself. If we are able to attain that process, we'll be truly wondrous for however we constitute archives and archivists for all our entanglements. This is not altruism. This is Ursula Le Guin's broad, broad solidarity in a broad sense that shows us how we can construct a utopian archival shield soft enough to absorb a blow, yet hard enough not to crumble. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, we are now opening the session for any questions, if anyone has any. Um, Mark, we've received one question. I will display it for everyone here. Uh, the question is, how might we organize ourselves? Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I want to acknowledge the work of the UCLA 7 as actually existing organizing work that happened in California. Um, I also want to, so, you know, I think I, I talked a little bit about this too. It's, it's fundamentally unethical and uncaring that for us to can perpetuate a system of, of term labor. I have suffered through term labor myself. Um, I was lucky and privileged to make it out on the other side, but it still had impacts on my career. Um, and I think the process of unionization is really important as a way to, uh, at least in traditional repositories, uh, organize ourselves, um, you know, and build solidarity. Um, there's a lot of history of, of needing to provide similar care work in, in the context of unions. And I, I actually really credit my own experience of being in a union and getting represented under a union contract as an undercompensated worker uh, in my first year of grad school in a situation that actually required me to live in a residence hall and be be the residence hall's librarian. I think the other thing I'd, I want us to explore, and this is a little bit headier and maybe something I I love, it, you know, typically I'd like want to have hallways, co hallway conversations about, but I think there's an interesting opportunity rather than in terms of, you know, sort of just thinking about vendor relationships, I, I'd like to explore the notion of archival cooperatives. So rather than, you know, working with a private vendor that, you know, to provide archival services, can we self-organize uh, into cooperatives of 
archivists who are aligned in values and work style. Um, although I know that cooperatives are not also not without their labor issues and uh, and can constitute other, you know, they, they have their own very real problems that are a reflection of the same problems that we have in society. Thank you. Um, um, I have another question. I'm displaying that now. How can we free ourselves from cycles of grant funding that contribute to our culture of contingent labor? <laughs> oh boy, that's another big one. Um, I have to give credit to the work of the collection building and uh, operational impact working group um, that uh, my partner Chad Weber was involved in. I I am not. I don't have the, the their report up. I will dig up a link and, and refer to it. But but part of this is actually to understand how much work, like the the how how much effort, how much time, how much cost it actually means uh, to you know to to be able to do our work. You know we can't just continue to acquire, uh, and because we we end up with these interminable ba backlogs. Um, the work that this, this working group has done through OCLC research is to actually provide a model that allows us to better estimate costs of acquisitions, of cataloging. Um, it builds on similar digitization cost calculators and can inform some, some uh, curatorial and selection decisions. I, I also wanna make it clear, I'm not just like, just like the Seaboy working group that I'm not throwing curators under the bus. Um, part of this process is to build uh, new models of curatorship that, you know, while I are advocate that we should stop buying collections, we need curators on board for this too. Um, I wanna acknowledge that one person who I think is really important um, in my thinking of this is work that um, Shannon O'Neill um, at NYU has done uh, on this, and I know that she's really interested in in rethinking the curatorial relationship, um, particularly as it relates to uh, our labor archives and, and uh, archives of radical movements. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have another question here. I'll display that for everyone. We need to build solidarity. How might SCA as an organization provide structure for that? Is a future that organizations like SC is there a future that organizations like SCA can build toward that we can imagine? Um, I think so. I touched on this a little bit in the talk. Um, I know that it, what I I think we SCA can be a model of an organization in a large and geographically dispersed state that rethinks, uh, rethinks it's the way that we meet and do our business. Um, so I think, you know, for better or for worse, while I know that pandemic Zoom brain is very real, I'm really interested in ways that we can rethink our meetings online, whether that's through pre-recorded sessions in some cases, which actually may improve with things like accessibility, as well as, um, as well as thinking about sort of different kinds of, of co-created programming where we're actually collaborating. Um, I, I talk a little bit about this in the talk, uh, but I think the reality is that professional organize, organizations still have a lot of work to do to be able to provide things like child uh, childcare. It's still understood to be available on kind of a limited basis, even for organizations that are able to fund it. Um, so I think part of this is while I know there are many attendant, you know, risks to caring for somebody's somebody else's children, I, you know, I I want us to think about what building a community of care in a professional organization looks like. It means we need to again not assume that the only thing that we have in common with people is that we do the same kind of work. And as we know, like even those of you who are actual archivists who are working with records or working with archives users on a daily basis. We know there's a lot of different kinds of work. So like the, this, this myth of a profession or a professional organization that needs to serve one particular, uh, one, one particular like kind of const constituted vision of that I think is, is needs to fall away. Um, what that means for an organization though, is that 
organizations need money. It's hard to do this without infrastructure. Um, so I think part of this is thinking about uh, ways in which we build and leverage other forms of solidarity. Um, I'm thinking about like facilitator trainings, like we can't do this without funding, but we need to provide alternative models. So I think the long-winded answer is I think <laughs> to fix arch archival organizations, we need to fix society, but fixing society is a long pro process. But I think we can make some incremental changes on the way that make our meetings and our organizations more inclusive. Thank you. Um, looks like we maybe have um, one more question, which I will display and um, read out loud. Can you speak to the false tension between innovation, which every leader in library loves, and maintenance of archives and archival collections, which seems perpetually underfunded and invisible? Um, I'm going to go back to the prestige TV thing because I recently finished watching uh, Halt and Catch Fire. I mean, I think the reality is that innovation can be underfunded too. Um, I work for a, an institution which is widely thought by a lot of people, including ourselves, to be innovative. Um, so it's it's really, really complicated. Um, I think part of what I'm trying to, to tease out is that Innovation and maintenance itself is not a hard dichotomy. That's kind of actually, when I started writing this talk, that's something I thought I was gonna say a little bit more boldly, but I've actually dialed back from. Um, but because we, we do, I, we need to change our practice, but we need to change our practices in, in technology in ways that are mindful and caring. We're not throwing out the history of archival theory, just like we're not, you know, for all its complexity. Um, you know, there's a lot of rather old archival theory at this point, which is still important. It's still reflective of, of a, a previous racist order, but there are important ideas that are still underneath it. And so part of it is going through a process of, of deeply understanding it. Um, I think also, you know, this for me, this ties back to Hedstrom and Summers talking about um, sort of the role of understanding archives as socio-technical systems. It's like, again, you know, there there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of maintenance that goes on that still needs to go on within other kinds of socio-technical systems too. And there's a the the maintainers community I think has written a lot on this. Um, this is an area of the literature that I'm less well-versed in myself. I've been doing a lot more reading on the concept of innovation than I have been in terms of maintenance. Um, uh, but uh, there, the information maintainers community um, put out a white paper. I actually in, I shared a link in response to, to, to someone else earlier this morning on Twitter, um, and I can, I'll retweet that. Um, but that's, you know, there's a lot of examples of this, but you know, part of this is maybe reselling maintenance as innovation, and which, which you know, it feels gross and it is gross. But uh, I, I want us to go beyond sort of the sim simplest, uh, simplistic notions of advocacy that are that are organ that our professional organizations ask us to follow. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, no one has uh, posted any other questions in the queue. So I'm going to assume that if there are no more questions, then um, we can consider this plenary session closed. I'll give another minute or two. Um, in the meantime, I wanna thank everyone for attending. Mark, especially thank you so very much for such a thoughtful, thought-provoking session. Um, gave us lots to think about as a profession for sure. The next sessions will begin in half an hour, um, 10.30. There will be three sessions. So um, everyone, once this plenary is concluded, um, feel free to log out of here and find the next session that you'd be interested in attending. And in those couple of minutes, Mark, there have been no more questions that have been asked. So I will let the host know 
that we can um, close the session unless you have any closing remarks. I think the only thing I, um, I'm on Twitter, I see a couple of people talking about my talk. Um, I, at me, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna say don't at me, but like, if you disagree with me, I'd love to hear from you because I know these are these are tricky and complicated ideas and not everyone's gonna agree. So, um, so at me, at an archivist, uh, it's easy to find me on Twitter. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you in another session soon. And thanks, Leilani. Thanks, Tanya.